the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. You have nothing to do but to save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work and go not only to those that need you, but to those who need you most, to save as many souls as you can, to bring as many sinners as you possibly can to repentance. Light yourself on fire with passion, and people will come from miles to watch you burn. Father, may that be said of us here at Crosswinds. May we indeed light ourselves on fire with passion for you, and may the world come to watch us burn. Lord, may it be obvious. May you bring revival to our midst. Lord, may the words of my mouth this morning and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, for you are my rock and my redeemer. And we give this time to you now. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's children said, amen, amen guys. Well, uh, we live in interesting times, don't we? Stressful times, times that uh, uh, it, it can be depressing. And I'll, I'll admit, I'm stressed at times. I am depressed. I, I see what's happening in our society, and I wonder how in the world can, can we conquer this? I start looking forward to the return of the Lord because I'm thinking that's the only thing that's ultimately going to, well, ultimately, yeah, it is ultimately going to solve it. But, but I'm thinking that's the only thing that is going to solve this totally missing the fact that I have within me and those of us who know Christ have within us the answer, the solution. And yeah, it's going to be glorious when Jesus returns, but until then, we are to be about his work. We are to be doing what he has called us to do. And yet here we are in this society that is, that is pretty much divided down the middle, socially and politically. And then we have this, for the past year and a half, this pandemic. If you heard, as if it wasn't bad enough, now L.A. County is now saying you got to put the masks back on because we have another wave coming through. And I don't know how that hits you, but it's like, oh my goodness, when, when is it going to come our way? When is that kind of stuff going to happen? And, and race relations don't show any signs of becoming any better. And so you have these fights, these, these literal battles going on in uh, school boards, uh, school, uh, uh, yeah, school boards across the country. And then there's these fights and these battles and people are carted off in handcuffs and going to jail. And yet, did, did you see this past week that the San Francisco Gay Men's Choir put out a video and then yanked it a couple of days later, but they put out a video entitled, of all things, We're Coming for Your Children. Now, they say, and, and I don't doubt that they would say, or I don't doubt the, the sincerity of what they're saying, but they're saying, well, that was meant in, in jest. It was meant in, a, you know, it was like a parody. And I'm thinking, really? <laughs> you thought that was going to go over well? We're coming for your children? And in the midst of all of this, the place where we should be able to find comfort, where we should be able to find a semblance of reasonableness, where, we, where there should be a place where, where people can come and say, yes, this, this place makes sense because we're following God. He makes sense. And yet the church seems to be having less and less of an influence on the society around us. On the way to church this morning, I heard uh, about one of those school board meetings, and apparently the first speaker got up there and announced that this, this afternoon or this evening, you're going to hear from the followers of Jesus who are dripping with hate, and that's their view of we in the church. As a youth pastor, I was discouraged by the statistics of youth ministry uh, back then, and I don't know if it's changed or not. I hope it has, but I wouldn't be surprised if it hasn't. But back then, 95% of young people, teenagers who are following Jesus Christ, who are active in their churches and in their youth ministries, 95% of them leave church once they graduate from high school. Now, later, some of them come back, and as I've shared this statistic over the years, I'll often ask the crowd, the group group that I'm, I'm sharing with, did, did you fit that bill? Is that your story? And it's not unusual that a majority of the hands go up. I think sometimes, are we really making it? Are we, are, are we doing what we're called to do or are we failing? And one of the things that it strikes me as I hear people's opinions of the church is that we have succeeded in doing to Jesus Christ what even his enemies couldn't do. We have made Jesus Christ ignorable. 
right? We have made it possible for people to ignore the claims of Christ. Or even worse, and, and, and this is even more striking, we've actually made Jesus and the gospel boring. I mean, think about that. The greatest news of all time. You can go from death to life, and somehow, some of us are good enough that we can actually make that message boring. The Apostle Paul spoke to this to a church that was in, in distress. It was the church in Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians 4.18, here's what he said to them. Now, some of you have become arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. And then I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God is not in words, but in power. It goes along with those sayings that we hear, you know, don't tell me so much about your faith, show it to me, live it out. You say you believe certain things, you say you're a follower of Jesus Christ, how much do you really look like Jesus? And that's the society we're in. And lest we think it's the worst possible of all societies down through history, I'm here to tell you there have been worse. Turn in your Bibles to uh, that, that, fit, that book that we all know and love, 2 Chronicles. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, we're going to uh, start there this morning. And uh, I would encourage you to pull out the note cards you got at the door. If you're online with us, those, uh, where is it? Well, anyway, if you're online with us, those notes are available uh, on our uh, church app. And, um, and follow along with us this morning. What we have in, uh, starting in verse 1, and I'll just talk you through some of it because there's a lot of text here. But starting in verse 1, we have uh, one of the kings of Israel, uh, the, uh, Manasseh. And Manasseh uh, began ruling uh, at the age of 12. And it says of him, as it did of many of the kings, that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, if we think we've got it bad, if we think we have issues with our government, look at some of the things that Manasseh did. He rebuilt the, the pagan altars, the high places that his father, Hezekiah, who was a good king, Hezekiah had torn all of that down, had stopped that. His son Manasseh builds it back up again. He actually built an, a pagan altar right in the temple of the Lord. He practiced witchcraft and divination and sorcery. He even, and this, this is the one that gets me, he even sacrificed his own son in the fire, it tells us. In other words, he, he, he gave his son as a pagan sacrifice. He ruled for 55 years and is arguably one of the worst rulers in all of history. Now, he did repent before his de death as he was carted off into exile or taken off into Babylon as a slave. It says they, they literally hooked him and, and, and took him off to, uh, to Babylon. And when he died, his son Ammon took over. And Ammon was just as bad as his father, only probably less creative. It says in verse 22 here that he did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father had done. And so the only good thing I would say about Ammon is that his rule only lasted for two years. And then his own officials couldn't take it anymore and they assassinated him. And so considering the condition of the nation at this point, it must have been really depressing. And yet into this situation comes a boy of eight years old by the name of Josiah. And what did this eight-year-old boy king do? We see in 2 Chronicles 34, 2, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the ways of his father David, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. And in the, uh, in going on, in the eighth year of his reign, if you calculate that, he's now 16 years old. Don't tell me young people have to wait to have an influence, okay? Here's a 16-year-old, and in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still a youth, he began to seek the God of his father David. And I believe this form of seeking took the form of prayer, and we're going to see why in a minute, uh, uh, why I think it's, it's limited at this point to just prayer, but this yearning and this seeking obviously made an impact on his life. And he saw around him behaviors and activities that must have grieved him. And at some point, he devised a plan. Well, not at some point. It was four years later, okay? And he, and he took action, okay? I'm the king. I'm 20 years old, and I'm ready to go to work. And look what it says if you pick it up in uh, verse 3. 
And it says in his 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim, the carved images, the metal, uh, the cast metal images. He tore down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and he chopped down the incense altars that were high above them. And he broke in pieces the Asherim, the carved images, and the cast metal images, and he ground them to powder and scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. And then he burned the bones of the priests on their altars, and he purged Judah and Jerusalem. And in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, and as far as Naphtali, in their surrounding spaces, he also tore down the altars, crushed the ashram and the carved images into powder, chopped down all of the incense altars throughout the land of Israel, and then he returned to Jerusalem. Man, a 20-year-old is doing all this. And in the next few verses, we see here that he turns the entire nation around. But what we really see, what we're really seeing here is that he has cleaning the nation up externally. And the real question now is, how can this be transformed into an internal change and an internal transformation in their lives? Well, we read on during Josiah's 26th year, as the temple is being repaired, something amazing happens. We pick it up in verse uh, 14 of 2 Chronicles 34. It says, When they were bringing out the money which had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. You catch what that's saying? They didn't have God's word. All right? And what does he say? Uh, he reported, he responded to Shaphan the scribe. I have found the book of the law of, in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and Shaphan brought the book to the king and reported further word to the king, saying, Everything that has been entrusted to your servants, they are doing. They have emptied out the money which was found in the house of the Lord, have handed it over to the supervisors and the workmen. Moreover, it's sort of like, oh, and by the way, uh, the, 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 Shaphan the scribe informed the king, saying, Hilkiah, the high priest, gave me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. Guys, this nation was so far from God, they had even lost his word. And apparently weren't even aware of it. And Josiah had probably never heard from it before. And it's no wonder when I, when I realized that, that the state, they were in the state they were in. And so he tears his clothes as a sign of grief and repentance. And then a change began happening in the nation, a revival, if you will. They, they celebrated a Passover. Some would say it's probably the greatest Passover since the very first one. And I see in this passage this morning a lesson for each one of us, during, especially during these depressing and stressful times that we're living in, where people are divided, where people are uninterested in hearing what we have to say quite often, uninterested in God himself. And I believe we can experience these kinds of results that we see happening with Josiah. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, okay, but Josiah was a king. Josiah had political power. Josiah could make decisions like that. And so, you know, I don't have that kind of power. What do you expect of us? Well, the thing is, guys, Israel and Judah had many kings. Some of them were even good kings, okay? But none of them accomplished what Josiah did. So what was different about Josiah? It's not that he was a king. What's different about Josiah is that his dependence was completely upon God. He completely looked to the Lord to provide a spiritual awakening. And guys, that is a difference that is available to every one of us today. Do you want to see revival in our nation? Even more, do you maybe want to see revival in your old, own life? Do you want to see revival in our church? Well, in this account, I see a number of what I've termed, for lack of a better term, prerequisites, if you will, for revival. First off, let me just define it for you. What is revival? Revival is very simply a renewed zeal to obey God. And, and there's a couple of things we need to talk about or realize when we think about revival. First off, God himself is the only source of true revival. 
There there have been plenty of revivals that have been man-made, and they demonstrate that because they fall apart after a while. If God is in charge of it, it is going to have eternal results. It is going to be something amazing. The second thing that we see is that quite often, and not just in this account, but in revivals that have happened down through, through history, that quite often God waits in bringing revival until we have exercised our own faith and obedience. I love the way G. Campbell Morgan puts it when he talks about revival. He says, we cannot organize revival, but we can set our sails to catch the wind from heaven when God chooses to blow upon his people once again. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. What, con- what, what is it that is setting our sails? What, what uh, actions constitute that? And here's the first one I see coming out of this passage in 2 Chronicles. And that is this. We need to recognize the need for revival. That's what what Josiah was doing early on. Now, I know some of you may think, well, that's kind of silly. I mean, of course, of course we recognize the the need. Who who wouldn't? Don't don't we recognize that? Well, think about it this way. I don't know if your children were like mine, but quite often uh, they would recognize the need to take a bath. That doesn't mean they did anything about it. You know, I mean, it's like the kid, you know, you're, you're pretty dirty. Well, yeah, I'm prettier when I'm clean, but yep, I'm pretty dirty. And, and once, you, once you realize they are aware of that, it doesn't change their actions. You see, until they are gripped by the need, until we are gripped by a need, it really hasn't been recognized. And again, I see this is what Josiah, I believe, was doing in those years between 8 and 20. In in John chapter 2, Jesus comes into the temple and realizes it needs to be cleansed of the money changers, of the people that are behaving unseemly in the temple. Do you think Jesus is the first person that recognized that? I have a hard time believing that. I, I, I can't imagine that Jesus is the first rabbi to walk into the temple and say, you know, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Maybe this stuff shouldn't be going on in here. But what did Jesus do? He really recognized the need for a change. And he did something about it. And he overturned the temples. In fact, his later, later his disciples were quoted as saying in John 2.17, they remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume you. And guys, there's a good question to ask yourself. It's a question I've been asking myself this week. What is it that consumes me? What consumes me to the point where where I will do whatever it takes to deal with that issue or to be be consistent with what I am saying? What consumes me? What moves me to this kind of an action? So the first thing we need to do is to recognize there is a need for revival. Secondly, and we talked about this pretty extensively last week, we need to humble ourselves, humble yourself before the Lord. Now, you know, humility, that's a a, a difficult thing to grasp. There's the old joke about, you know, the guy who wrote the book, Humility and How I Attained It, okay? And then at that point, if there was a, 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 a prize given for humility, the first place person would then lose the prize. You know, that's, that's the, the, the awkward thing about humility. And yet we see here, without real humility, there can be no revival. We talked about it last week. It was in uh, the end there of uh, First Peter. And James says in James 4.10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. He will revi- revive you. And as I said last week, just a brief reminder, humility is not thinking less of myself than I ought to think. So you know, in other words, you don't go around saying, oh, I'm a worm, I'm a worm, I'm just horrible. No, it's, it's actually valuing yourself with the same value that God does. And he valued you and me so much that he sent his one and only son to die for us. Also, it's important to recognize that humility is not something that that some people have and other people don't. Nobody has humility naturally. It's something that only God gives. You don't become humble by thinking about, gee, how can I become humble? I want to be the best humble person in the whole church. You can see the, the problems in that. No, instead, rather than focusing on humility, you focus on something or even better, someone else. It's again, as I said last week, goes to that song, let's forget about ourselves and magnify the Lord and worship him. 
In other words, we are so focused on Christ and on his commands and on his word that we forget ourselves. I am so focused on, on that individual that I forget about my own needs. And as I shared last week, parents, we often do that with our kids. Even if there's a dangerous situation, I'll, I'll run into it if, it's, if it means saving my kids. So having seen the need for spiritual awakening, both personal and corporate, we then bow down before the Lord, admitting that we cannot produce it ourselves. Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 57, for this is what the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, says, I dwell in a high and lofty place. And also with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. You see, God will revive us. He will revive the lowly and the contrite and the humble. He never revives proud people. And after, as we even saw with Peter, that was one of the advantages of the suffering. After our suffering, he himself will restore us. Josiah, this boy king, probably had a lot of reasons to follow his own advice and, and, and especially even the advice of others, you know, uh, and, and not do anything because after all, you know, I'm so young and, and, and who do I think I am? And, and I could see some of his advisors saying, just, just hold off until you're, uh, you know, you're at a, a, a more reasonable age for people to listen to what you have to say. But he didn't do that. He listened and followed only the Lord. So humble yourselves before the Lord. The third step that I see is to confess your sins and repent. And that's essentially what we see Josiah doing. When he heard the book of the law for the first time, it says he tore his robe. And then he did the same with the people, picking it up in verse 29. Then the king sent word and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the Levites, and all the people from the greatest to the least. And he read in their presence all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. You think I have long sermons? Okay. <laughs> I'm not reading the whole Old Testament to you, right? And then the king stood in his place. And he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments, his testimonies, and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that are written in the book. And furthermore, he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin stand with him so that the inhabitants of Jerusalem acted in accordance with the covenant of God, the God of their fathers." Sin, guys, is this great curse that blocks God's power. And, and as Psalm 66, 18 reminds us, if I had regarded wickedness in my heart, the Lord would not hear me. It would be like one time I was, uh, uh, it, it's funny, you know, I'm a, I'm a professional driver and yet sometimes you do the stupidest things. And I, I got into our church bus and I start the thing up and, I, you know, I let it warm up enough and then I hit the, I put it in gear and I hit the accelerator and it's not moving. It's not going anywhere. And I press the accelerator harder and it's still not moving. It's not going anywhere. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I got a load of kids here. What are we going to do? And then I realized I hadn't released the emergency brake. <laughs> And that's kind of what trying to interact with the Lord is like if you have sin in your life. It's like you're trying to go forward, uh, you know, with, uh, with pressing on the accelerator at the same time that you have the brake on. But sin, when we talk about sin, sin is more than just that obvious, those, those things that we do. Romans 3.23 tells us that we all have sinned and far, fallen short of the glory of God. That is those that are blatantly sinful and, and those of us who hide our sin behind a, a mask of righteousness, okay? We are, we are all sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. It's who we are. And so what do we do about it? Proverbs 28, 13 tells us one who conceals his wrongdoings will not prosper, but one who confesses and abandons them will find compassion. Oftentimes people will say those things that you do in the dark, if you want to have victory over them, you shine the light on them. You bring it out into the open. You share with others. And so you confess uh, your sins. You agree with God. That's literally what that word means. You agreed with God that you have sinned. You agree with God that Christ has died for that sin. And you agree that you're already forgiven if you know him. 
1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so I don't hide my sin from God. I make it obvious. And, necessary, I, I, and if necessary, I don't hide it from others as well. Those who I have sinned against, I need to go to them as well. And then finally, I need to repent, to turn around. That's literally, to repent means to change your mind. It means 180 to return. I need to stop doing it, change my thinking. And then finally, I need to accept it. I need to accept it and start living like it. The sad thing is I see so many Christians living unfruitful lives because of the things that I have done and the kind of person that I am. And if you only knew the kind of person I was, you know, you, you wouldn't want to be talking to me. But if you knew the kind of person I was, you wouldn't want to be listening to me, okay? Can we all agree that we're all sinners? We've all got struggles. But Jesus Christ has cleansed us from that, that sin. He has put it as far away from us as the East is from the West. And we need to accept it. I wonder sometimes how frustrating the Lord must be with me when I continue to dredge up my past and and allow that to hold me back. As if somehow I'm going to live up to that standard when he says, I've given you a a, a new life. I've given you a new heart. You're clean. You're, You're whiter than snow. Accept it. Confess, repent, and accept. Those are the three things. Write those in your notes. Confess, accept, uh, confess, repent, and accept. Remember, guys, too, the Spirit is the author of our conviction, and the Spirit is the power, gives us the power to change. You can't do it on your own. It's through His Spirit. Number four is this. Begin to pray continuously for revival. There has never been, as we see in Scripture and even as, we, as I hear about in history, in church history, there has never been a great move of God's Spirit without there also being a great move of fervent prayer for that. And I'm not knocking down prayers for people who are sick and prayers, you know, you know praises for what God has done and, and, and prayers, you know, I need a new car. I mean, those are, th- those are great things. We can come boldly before the throne of grace and we can make those prayers. But the fact is, guys, we need to be praying for revival. Sunday nights, we have our, our church prayer time. We call it before the throne. And years ago, when I was convicted of this, I added that to our prayer list because I looked at our prayer list and we were doing all the prayers for our missionaries and for our ministers and, and for people's sicknesses and all of that. But there was nothing in there officially saying, Lord, revive us. Lord, uh, you know, you know, you know, make us the people that you want us to be. Uh, empower us to reach our worlds for you. So we need to pray continuously for revival. This is what I see Josiah doing here in those years prior to this revival. And and, and frankly, guys, the best example of the need for prayer, no surprise, it's Jesus Christ himself. In Luke 11, 1, the disciples ask Jesus to teach them something. And I've often thought, what would I, if I had a chance, what would I want Jesus to teach me? I'm thinking, hey, why don't you teach me how to how to lead the way you do, because obviously you've created a a great movement. uh, Could you teach me how to speak and captivate an audience the way you do, Lord? Can you maybe teach me how to do some of those miracles? No, these guys had seen all of those things, but what did they ask? It says in 11.1, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. I believe they recognized that, that was, it was that prayer time that Jesus had. It was that, that connection that he had with his father that was the source of his power. And boy, was it ever. Was Jesus ever committed to prayer? He began his ministry in prayer. In Luke 3.21, it says, as he was praying, as Christ was praying, heaven opened and the spirit descended as a dove. That's during his baptism. He continued in prayer throughout his ministry. Luke 5, 16 says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. At times, the disciples were even like, where is he now? Oh, he's off praying again. He ended in prayer in Gethsemane and on the cross. His final words to his father were a prayer. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And finally, we read in scripture that he continues to pray for us. Hebrews 7.25 tells us that he always lives to make intercession for them. He is today at the right hand of the father, making intercession, praying on our behalf. 
F.D. S.D. Gordon put it this way. He says, the Lord is still praying. 30 years of living, three years of serving, one tremendous act of dying, 1,900 years of prayer. What an emphasis on prayer. And guys, if this was necessary for Jesus, can we do any less? We need to be like Jacob who struggled in Genesis 32 with God himself and, and said, unless you bless me, I will not let you go. James wrote in James 5, 16 to, that we are to confess our sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed for the prayer of a righteous person when it is brought about can accomplish much. Guys, if we will continue in prayer, it will accomplish much. God's word promises that. What's the last thing? Number five, call others to join with you in prayer. As we saw with Josiah, it began with him, and then he began involving others, and ultimately it was the entire nation. And that's the way revivals tend to go. They start out with a few people, maybe even just one like Josiah, but, but a few people start out and they begin praying and the excitement begins to build. And at some point, which is again determined by God, it, 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 to use a nuclear term, critical mass is achieved and it explodes. And, some, and, and at that point, you can't deny God is doing something here. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, it says to us, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Or how about John 15.7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And as we say, the key phrase there is asking in his name. Does Jesus want revival? Absolutely. Does God want to see a, a, a renewed zeal of, uh, among the people who are following him? Of course he does. This idea of remaining in me, remain, uh, Richard Lovelace said it this way, remaining in Christ means staying in touch with the other parts of his body. Being in community with members of his body, of, of the body of Christ, is essential to spiritual renewal. That's been one of the difficulties of the pandemic. I know uh, there, there are many people today saying, well, do we even need to meet together anymore? Because we've got the internet now and we can join with people literally around the world. Yes, guys, we need to meet together. There is a need to be here. And, and what's been gratifying to me as, as, have I, as I've gotten out and have met with many of you, that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the, the thing that I consistently hear over and over and over. A, a number of you have discovered that when you're not allowed to be here, you suddenly realize how important this is, right? Amen? <laughs> I mean, I, and, and they say, I, I've, I've got to be here. I, I've, I've, we've got to meet together. Well, it's, that's because Scripture tells us to and because that's how we're wired. Now, as I conclude here, I want you to know that there are people that question the need for something like a revival. And, and they, would, they would point to passages in Scripture, for instance, that say that, that God and Christ are always at work. John 15, 17 says, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. And so they would, they would reason then, if he's always at work, then why do we need this special work of God? Well, let me tell you. If you have a rainstorm, I know it's California and we don't get many of those, but, uh, you know, if, if it rains, it's like, okay, it's, it's raining. But if you have a deluge, in California, we go on storm watch, okay? Everybody sits up and take notice. Let, let's, let's do a more California thing. If we have an earthquake, right? They, they say there's hundreds, maybe even thousands of them a day, you know? We, and, and we're Californians, right? So the earth shakes a little bit, eh, no big deal. You know, that's one of the things we're proud of. We, we handle earthquakes. They don't bother us at all. But if it really shakes and freeways overpasses start falling down and we see a crack in the building, okay, we're paying attention now, right? Suddenly we're paying attention. Guys, that's what revival does. When God comes in power, nothing is ever the same. People who would have no interest in him now are suddenly thinking about him. And I believe there are many times as we see in scripture, as we see in church history, when that's exactly how God wants to work. Remember what he says, what, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God is not in words, but in power. God wants glory for himself. 
And what brings more glory to God than something that cannot be explained by a church being able to manufacture it or by a pastor being able to create it on himself. There are those times, as I said early on, when I feel rather stressed and depressed because I look around at the world and I see what's happening. You know why I feel that way? Because I haven't been revived. And I need the Lord to renew my zeal in him. And he's done it this week because when you're going to preach something like this, you start practicing these things. And I put them into practice. And so I would say to you, are you stressed today? Are you depressed? Are you, are you lacking direction in your life? Well, I, quest, I ask you, have you created an environment in your life for revival? Do you follow the steps we've outlined, recognizing the need, humbling yourself, confessing your sins, repenting, and, and then start praying for revival, and then even call others in your, your close friends, maybe others in your life group or your meow groups to pray with you for this? And guys, once again, I have to emphasize, the power for carrying these things out comes from the Lord. I share that because I always shudder at having these, these uh, you know, five steps to a spiritual life. Or, uh, you know, you want to be, you want to be blessed to do these things. I mean, a, a lot of us, and I'm one of them, can take something like that and say, okay, you know, I'm very deterministic. I'm going to, I'll follow the steps and God owes me revival. Okay, that ain't the way it works. These are not magic steps. They're, they're biblical steps. They're, they're what we see people doing. But guys, the power to carry out this is in God himself. What did we say at the beginning? Uh, the the uh, uh, G. Campbell Morgan quote, we're setting our sails. That's what these steps are. They're setting our sails to catch the wind from heaven when God may choose to blow upon us again. I want to be there. When he's ready to go, I want to be ready to go with him and not until then. Colossians 6.2 says very tellingly, therefore as you have received Christ Jesus your Lord, so walk in him. That's how we are to live our Christian life. And I think the earliest illustration I ever got was from my pastor. I, I was discipling with him in his office and he shared with me this verse, and he says, you know what that really means, Willie. Do, let, let me illustrate it for you. He says, how do you walk? And, I, you know, how do you answer a question like that? You put one foot in front of the other. He says, yes, you're right. You do put one foot in front of the other. But he said, there's more to it. If you just stand there and you put one foot in front of the other, are you walking? Oh, I'm not going anywhere. But, but I got one foot in front of the other. No, the only way you're actually going to walk is if you put that foot in front of the other and then you fall forward, right? Think about it. And as I fall forward, that foot hopefully is going to catch me. Now I know as we get older, that's not always going to be the case. You got to, you got to, so we get the walkers and the, you know, the crutches and things like that. But hopefully for most of us, we put our foot out there, we put it, we go forward and it catches us. Okay. And that's kind of a good picture of walking in Christ. Because what am I doing? I don't know about you, but I don't think about my foot going out in front of me. I'm not walking along saying, okay, I'm off balance. I'm going to fall. Okay, good, there's my foot. Okay, make sure my foot goes out there. Okay, I mean, that's not what's going on in my head. I don't think about things breathing. You better take a breath. You better let it out. Okay, <laughs> we don't think about those things. What am I doing? I am literally, when I walk, when you walk, I'm literally walking by faith. I'm going forward and I'm not even thinking about it. My foot's going to come out there. I believe it or else I better sit down. And as I say, you, you get to this place in, in life sometimes where the foot doesn't come out there and then you do sit down because it's not worthy of your faith anymore. But that's what the Lord wants to do for us. That's, that's, how, that's, how the, that's the ideal of walking in faith when it's the Lord Jesus Christ, when, when it's God who's directing your steps. Because you know he's going to be there. He's going to be that, that he's going to catch you when you fall. And so this morning, if you're struggling, if you're, if you're in a place in your life where you don't know which way to turn, well, turn it over to him. If you, you know, one person put it this way, if you're at the end of your rope, you know, well, then let go of the rope and let God take care of it at that point. And in fact, even better than walking in Christ, I think in reality that God has called us to run in him. It's funny to think about it now. 
it wasn't that long ago. But when I was younger, when I was a kid, I used to run. I used to run everywhere. Something in me. I wouldn't stop. I, I ran to my parents. I ran to my bed. I just ran. And I think, I think we're all sort of like that. We're all on fire for life. With no responsibilities. Just living. And excited to get places. And, and then at some point, I stopped. We all stopped. We just started walking. We started coping, getting comfortable, getting content. We were no longer on fire. We were no longer passionate. There was no longer the burning desire in our hearts. But we kept walking, fitting in. And you could call it whatever you want, proper, easy, normal, but it all just seems so boring. Is this what it was about? But maybe we need to get passionate again. Maybe life isn't about being comfortable or content or making it easy. Maybe we were supposed to be different and be passionate, not lukewarm. Maybe instead of walking around and being normal, we are supposed to be radical. Maybe we're supposed to run. Heavenly Father, would you take my words today, and even more importantly, Lord, would you take your word and just write it on our hearts? Father, may we mull over these things. May we, may we study them for ourselves. May we not just take the word of, of even a pastor up front. May we be like the Bereans, where we go back to Scripture and we search this out for ourselves. But Father, once we recognize what you're truly asking of us, Lord, may nothing stop us from carrying that out. Lord, we say that we're Christians. We say that we're followers of Jesus Christ. Well, Lord, I want to be like Jesus in every sense of the word. I want to be sold out like Jesus. I want to be speaking like Jesus. I want to be acting like Jesus. Lord, I want to give my life like Jesus. Lord, I pray that we see that zeal in us, in our individual lives and in our corporate lives so that as we catch fire, the world will gather around to watch us burn. May that be the result. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.